Amen. Well, today uh, we want to finish out this series on habits. Has it been helping anybody? Series on habits. Amen. I pray that it's. I pray that it's been a blessing to you. It has been life changing for me. Uh, so I pray that it's been the same for you. And I want to tell you on the front end today. I believe will be one of the more difficult messages of the series for us to hear. And here is why. Because today's message focuses on our friends, the people who are close to us, the people we spend a lot of time with. The title for today is Your Social Network Matters. Your social network matters. So I just want to ask you to think about uh, when I was young, uh, we were told phrases from people who are a little bit older, a little bit more mature, to give us indicators, point us in the right direction about our friendships and our friend network. They would say things like, birds of a feather, Some of y'all heard that one. Some of y'all heard that one, right? They would say things like, you show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Yeah. Little indicators like, man, whoever you hanging out with, they're going to have influence on you. And if they doing crazy stuff and getting in a whole bunch of trouble, you will probably join them. And that's going to impact where you end up. (laughs) They would say a whole bunch of phrases just to remind us. Uh, I came across one, uh, you can't keep a clean reputation hanging with messy people. (laughs) Somebody like, I'm writing that down right now. I'm writing that down. All right. Hopefully you already put up your U-version notes. Amen. Somebody said, I'm writing that down. And then then, uh, this one, you know, you, you just shake your head. They would say... You lie down with dogs. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It would just be little indicators that the people that you're connected to have an impact on you. They influence you. Your relationships, your social network, it matters. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I know some of you are not going to participate, but I'm going to ask you anyway. It's my role to ask you to do stuff that you may not want to do, but you need to do. That's a part of my role. So I want to ask you uh, to write down or type in your phone if you're using your U-version notes or, or any other kind of notes. I want you to list your closest five friends or the five people you spend the most time with. Don't count your children. <laughs> I spent all my time with my babies. Yeah, don't count them yet. All right. But I want you to list your five closest friends or the people you spend, the five people you spend the most time with. Go ahead and take a moment. For some of us, thinking through it is going to be a challenge. If you only have two, that's cool. Write down the two. Write down, type in your phone, in your notes section, you version. Five people you spend the most time with. Your five closest friends. Write down their names. Because we're going to come back to it. <laughs> Write down their names. Give you about one more minute. Some of you all are writing. Some of you are like, I don't even want to list their names. I'm just going <laughs> to. Some spouses are like, no, write them down. Write them down. I got a feeling we're going to talk about your friends after church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they're your brothers, your sisters, your siblings, yes. Yeah. Good question. 
All right. So Jim Rohn says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. The basic idea is that we become like the people we spend the most time with. The people we spend the most time with have the most influence on us. When we need counsel, we naturally turn to the people we spend the most time with. When we're in conversation, we naturally have conversation with the people we spend the most time with. When we're listening, we naturally listen to the people we spend the, the most time with. So you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So on today, I just want to share uh, three ideas, three thoughts, three truths about our social network that I believe can help us in habit formation. And as I share these three truths, uh, the second one we're going to spend more time on than the first and the last. Um, but as I share them, we'll look at some insights from Scripture uh, just to highlight that this is not just psychology, this is not just theory, uh, but the Scripture affirms this truth. And because the Scripture for us is our final authority, then we're like, okay, if the Scripture says it, then it's true. All right? So here's the first one. Just want you to hear it. You already know it, hopefully, but just want you to hear it. Our friends circle or social network influences our behavior. Our friends circle or social network influences our behavior. There is a quote that I want to share. I want to read it for you uh, from a book called Connected, The Surprising Power of Our Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives by a Harvard professor. Um, Christy Christakis and Fowler write in their book Connected, our connections affect every aspect of our daily lives, how we feel, what we know, whom we marry, whether we fall ill, how much money we make, and whether we vote, all depend on the ties that bind us. Social networks spread happiness, generosity, and love. They are always there, exerting both subtle and dramatic influence over our choices, actions, thoughts, feelings, even our desires. And our connections do not end with the people we know. Beyond our social horizons, Friends of friends of friends can start chain reactions that eventually reach us like waves from distant lands that wash up on shores. That's in your notes in you version. It's this basic premise that people that we spend time with, that we are close to, they influence us. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul is talking about the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, that Jesus did die according to the scriptures, that he was buried according to the scriptures, that he was raised according to the scriptures. And he talks about the importance of our belief about the resurrection, about the bodily resurrection the importance of us having that conviction, of us being anchored in that truth. He talks about if Christ be not risen, we are still in our sins. If Christ be not risen, our preaching is in vain. He basically says everything hangs on the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. And then interestingly enough, when he gets to around verse 33, he highlights that there are some people in their midst who are teaching that we don't have to believe in the bodily resurrection and there's no such thing as a resurrection. And in talking about them, he makes this simple statement in verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. New Living Translation says it this way. Don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. Here, here's what Paul basically says to them. Don't be fooled by thinking 
that having those people in your midst and communicating this lie that Jesus is not resurrected and the resurrection does not matter, don't be fooled into thinking that it's not going to influence you. Don't be deceived into thinking that it's not going to play a part in how you view the resurrection. Their teaching will corrupt you. It will influence you. It's just a reminder that no matter how mature we are, no matter how much we know, no matter how much we read, no matter how independent we think we are, all of us are influenced by the people who are closest to us. So the first statement is the shorter one. Our friends, our social network, our circle, they influence our behaviors. So let's make the second statement, which builds on the first one. Our friends, our circle, our social network influences our behaviors in ways that either help us or hinder us. In the book Atomic Habits, he writes, we tend to imitate the habits of three social groups, the close, family and friends, the many, the tribe that we associate with, and the, pow the powerful, those with status and prestige, right? <laughs> so just a side note, not in my notes, but sometimes, um, you know you live long enough, you start to figure stuff out. So sometimes if I, if I see a teenager with a strange haircut, right, my first question is what person on TV had that haircut? That's my first question. Because somebody who they consider powerful or influential either had that haircut or, or they did the Cam Newton with the tight pants. And now you see 50-year-old men win. Right? Where did that start? That started seeing Cam. Like, man, that look cool on Cam. And because it looked cool on Cam, then guess what? Now you see it, right? So, so even people with power, they have, they have influence. They influence our behavior in a way that either helps us or hinders us. So uh, let's look at Scripture. Proverbs 13 and 20 says this. <laughs> Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Now, I shouldn't have to explain that, right? You walk with the wise, guess what? Because you were wise people, you start to pick up on some of their wisdom, you start to watch, you start to pay attention, and as you watch and you pay attention, you're like, hmm, that works, that's good. I need to do that. I'll start adding that into my life. So guess what? Because you walk with the wise, you spend time with the wise, you become wise. But on the other side, associate with fools and what? get in trouble at least to harm. So here's how it happened. Because the scripture doesn't say you become a fool. But here's what happens. You associate with fools and hang out with fools, eventually you get caught up in their foolery. Well, I didn't say it. They said it. I just happened to be in the room. Foolery. I didn't do it, but I was with them when they did it. Foolery. Like, I'm not guilty. I was just present. So a lot of the foolishness that they get involved in because you were hanging with the fool, you got associated with the foolishness. Anybody ever been falsely accused of stuff because you hung with fools. Come on, tell the truth. It's like, man, I got rid of that fool, got rid of that fool, <laughs> right? So, so it's, it's, that, it's that basic, why? Because they, they influence us for wisdom helps us, foolery hinders us. Here's another one, Proverbs 27 and 17, some of you know it, as iron sharpens iron, so one man or one friend sharpens another friend. It's, it's this premise that you get to become better 
because of relationship. You, you, you do know that if you, if you have iron like a sword, you want it sharp. Nothing worse than a dull knife. You want it sharp. So as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another friend. Because, because they are growing, you just by being in association with them are challenged to grow. Because they're thinking about certain things and you're challenged to think about those things. So let's look at some practical areas uh, where this truth applies. What happens oftentimes with people in our lives, they either become faith builders or fear creators. Faith builders or fear creators. Um, faith builders are people who feed into your faith and your confidence in God. Your belief that God is who he says he is. He can do what he said he can do. You are who he says you are, and you can do what he says you can do. They feed into that. They, they help build up your faith. But then there are some people in our lives who become fear creators. Uh-uh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Don't try that. Don't try that. That wasn't meant for you. I know other people. That's not meant for you. Don't, don't take that step. Because you might take that step, and this might happen. Or you might take that step, and this might happen. You, you, you don't want to be foolish and trust God like that, but because you never know what might happen. Right? It, uh, another writer says it's uh, people who have a fixed mindset. Things are the way they are. And people who have a growth mindset, we can change. See? Ooh, thank you, God. Um, sometimes uh, part of my, can I, can I just share? Because we're just talking, right? I'm, I'm teaching, but we're just talking. Sometimes a part of my frustration is my own fixed mindset, but, but then, you know, you, you sometimes get frustrated when you see stuff that's in you in others. So sometimes, sometimes my greater frustration becomes the fixed mindset of people I encounter in our community. Peoria always been like this. It's going to always be like this. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I ain't, I ain't come to Peoria for it to stay the same. If God was going to send me somewhere for it to stay the same, man, I would have picked some warmer places. You know what I'm saying? With some, a beach, an ocean, something. You know, give me a better view. Some mountains, some trees, something like that. If it's just going to stay the same. No, 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 we're not going to have a fixed mindset. That's just the way things are. Well, it's time for them to change. Right? So, so you have people who, who either feed into that growth mindset of things can change, or that fixed mindset is going to be the way it is. So here, here is how it shows up. So let's talk some practical stuff. It shows up in our relationships. So Proverbs 22, 24 and 25 says, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. Right? So when you think about your friends, right, if they're angry, then because those are the people you spend the most time with, those are the people you talk to the most, those are the people who have the greatest influence on you, you just become an angry person. Why are you mad? I don't know. I don't know why I'm mad. What happened? The people you talked to, they was mad. They was mad about everything. Why you raising your voice? I don't know. I don't know. They were just raising their voice. I don't know why I'm raising my voice. Right? That, that influence. So when you think about your relationships, here are some questions to ask. How good are the relationships of your closest friends? Not, not their relationship with you. But how good are their other relationships? Like, how good is their relationship with their parents? And how good is their relationships with their siblings? Because if they always got beef with their parents and then they talking to you about the beef, right? Then before you know it, you start to look at your parents differently. Right? If they, they always see problems with their siblings and they start talking to you, it, it may influence you. So just asking, how, how good are their close relationships? Another question to ask. Are their relationships healthy? Are they emotionally healthy? Thank God for the class, amen, for uh, Sister Gia, Brother Julio, leading and facilitating that class on emotionally healthy spirituality. What a blessing they have been and that class has been to our ministry. But people need to know, are they emotionally healthy? Why? If you're around emotionally unhealthy people, guess what? 
You typically act emotionally unhealthy. They influence you. Well, what you think we should do about it? I think you should just give them a piece of your mind. That's what I think you should do. You can't hold that stuff in. It's going to kill you if you hold it in. Just let it out. Like, wait a minute, we don't want to pray about it. We don't want to see what the root issue may be. All right, so just raising the question. Um, are the people who are in your five names that you have, are they messy? You know if they're messy or not. Come on, you ain't got to think about it twice. Are they messy? Are they loyal? Do they fight fair? So wrestling with it. Are they patient? Are they kind? Are they gentle? Are they forgiving? Do they keep records of wrong? Straight from 1 Corinthians 13. Why? Because the people who are closest to you will influence your relationships. So um, we try to encourage, uh, especially young married couples, you need to get with healthy married people. You need to get with them. Why? Because if you, fellas, can we just talk? If you would marry men who are always talking about how fine some other woman is, can we just say the devil is a lie that's unhealthy? Brothers, I thought I'd get a little bit more back from y'all. Do we need to lean in or is that a separate session? Come on, huh? Well, let me just check the room. How many married brothers in the room? I, oh, I just thought I'd check. Just thought I'd check. If nothing else, you should have said amen because you know your wife. If she ain't here, she got friends. they like, he ain't say amen. Pastor made this thing. He ain't say, I watched. He didn't say amen. <laughs> right? And if you're single... If most of your single friends don't know who they are, are not content with their relationship with God, and they need somebody for them to be complete, that's going to influence you. you need to, if you're single, you need to have some single friends who are healthy enough to say, I'm good with Jesus. Now, if he want to send me somebody, I'm definitely open. <laughs> But please let the record state, I'm good with Jesus, right? Why? Because they're going to influence you. Is this practical enough? All right. Uh, let's talk about our health for a moment. Let's talk about our health. Uh, so studies show again and again um, that the people you're around um, and how they deal with their health will influence how you deal with your health. So if your closest five friends, if they eat unhealthy, Guess what? You're going to eat unhealthy. Like we having wings? Yep. We having pizza? You read my mind. <laughs> right? Right? And if that's the norm, guess what? Nobody thinks otherwise because that's the what? It's the norm. Are we frying everything? We frying everything. <laughs> because you know it tastes better fried. Right? If, if they're not concerned about their health, they're not walking, they don't engage in any kind of exercise. Wait, wait, they're on medicine, but they don't take it? Come on! Their approach to health will impact and influence how you approach your health. So, um, uh, many of you know Pastor Copeland. Pastor Copeland's had influence on me in so many ways. And uh, Pastor Copeland is a healthy eater. <laughs> so, um, you know, the more I spend around time with Pastor Copeland, then I'd be like, yeah. I just start feeling bad ordering some of the stuff I was ordering. <laughs> it's like, man, you're going you to eat carrots and cauliflower as your appetizer? <laughs> like, you, you don't want no, no potatoes with sour cream and cheese on top? Sprinkle with some bacon bits? It's like, no, man, I think I'm going to get this spinach artichoke dip. <laughs> I'm like, spinach artichoke, does that even go together? And what is artichoke, right? I'm like, what is that, right? 
And just as a result of being around him and him talking to me about my health, he's a few years older, so he said, hey, man, I'm telling you, by the time you get to this age, you need to be on top of your health because your body starts to change. And you'll have more doctors visiting. You don't want to hear your doctor telling you got high cholesterol, you got high blood pressure, you got this and you got that. He said, I'm telling you, your diet makes the difference. All right? So here's the thing. If we're not talking to people who are concerned about their diet, if our closest friends, that's not a priority, it typically, not saying always, it typically will impact and influence how we view our health. I'll move on to the next one. We still in this help or hinder? Ooh, ooh, your finances. Your five closest friends will influence, help, hinder your view of your finances. Um, so if your five closest friends, if their view of finances is, I'm not even trying to pay all my bills. I'm just trying to pay enough of them not to get kicked out. That will influence you. It's like, you know what? You look good in that outfit. I think I'm just going to pay enough to not get kicked out so I can go get me an outfit like you did. Y'all didn't want to talk to me on this. That's all right. That's why we're going to spend a whole month. I was telling Christy this morning. I said, babe, I remember the first time I realized that it wasn't good for you to get a large income tax check. I remember, first time I, I was exposed to that, like, wait, wait, wait. You mean you're not supposed to look forward to getting a large income tax check? It's like, no, why would you do that? I'm like, wait, you gotta explain. I say, see, when you get a large income tax check, that means you gave the government too much money. So the government took your money, got interest off of it, because you let them keep it for a year. <laughs> so they got all the interest off of it, and then they gave it to you to say thank you for allowing us to get interest off money that didn't belong to us. I was like, are you killing me? <laughs> so how do I change my forms so that my money come to me so I can invest it for me so the interest can stay with me? I know I just helped somebody. <laughs> it's all good. So all I'm trying to say as it relates to your finances, if, if, if you're in a space where your friends don't know how to, how to pay off debt, then if they're influencing you, you may not be thinking about paying off debt. If you're in a space where your friends are not talking about investing, then you may not be talking about investing. Because many of us, our parents didn't talk to us about money. How many of you, like me, your parents didn't talk to you about money? You know, right? You just knew bills got paid. That was it. You was glad, like, did they do it? We still in the house, right? You just knew bills got paid. But they didn't talk to you about money. They didn't talk to you about saving. They didn't talk to you about having an emergency fund. They didn't talk to you about uh, investing. They didn't talk to you about IRAs and stuff like that. They, they didn't talk to you about stocks and bonds and, and stuff like that. They didn't talk to you about compound interest and how the earlier you start, even if you just put a little away each month, especially if you're young, like in your 20s, you just put a little bit away each month. If God let you live to get to be your 60s, that little bit will add up to a lot because of compound interest. They didn't talk to you about that. And if you don't have friends that talk about that, then that's going to influence you. Am I talking to anybody? Yeah. All right. So help hinder in our finance. Um, obviously help hinder in our faith life. Our faith life. So the passage I want to read, um, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. So Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 19. Why are you getting there? Let me just give you a snapshot. Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 19, uh, is a term. Hebrews 1 up to Hebrews 10, verse 18, the writer's been making this argument that Christ is greater. He's our sufficiency. 
Uh, Christ is greater than all the prophets. Christ is greater uh, than angels. Christ, Christ is greater. What he brings in the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. He's, he's the greatest high priest. He, he's the great sacrifice. E everything that you read in the Old Testament pointed to him. It was a foreshadowing of him. And he is the ultimate fulfillment of everything that's been talked about. And... Because Christ is the greatest and he has fulfilled everything that has been talked about, the forgiveness that Israel was longing for year after year when they would make the sacrifices for their sin, and yet they got to come back again and make sacrifice for their sin because they couldn't make sacrifices that would cover the sin once and for all. Christ came and he laid down his life and he paid for our sin once and for all so that no more offerings have to be made. You don't have to bring animals to the gathering to make offerings for your sin. Even though we sin every day, Christ paid it once and for all. And because Christ paid it once and for all, we now have access to the Father. And because we have access to the Father, we're a part of his family and we are his children. We have a new relationship and a new status. And because of that, he says this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. He, he, gives, he gives three action items like, man, okay, make, make sure that, that we remind each other to affirm the hope that we have in Jesus. Make sure that we encourage one another in this faith, in this new relationship, and make sure that we connect with one another, spend time with one another so that we might encourage each other because the day of his return is approaching. It's, it's about this community of faith. This, our faith like is impacted by our friend group. That's why I mentioned Develop a habit of coming to church. Not because the building does anything. Develop a habit of being in community with other believers. Not, not, not because there's so much power in one person over another person, but, but what God sets up in the community is as we gather together, we affirm to one another our hope. As we gather together, we're to encourage one another. As we gather together, we're like, man, we got to hold fast to the teachings of Christ. See, your closest friends will impact and influence, help or hinder what you do in your faith life, in your spiritual life. So they're like, hey, well, we just going to kick it every Saturday. Well, what about us getting in community for some time around the Word and some time in dialogue and some time in prayer to encourage each other? Uh, we ain't really got time for that. And before you know it, you keep pushing that away, pushing that away, and pushing that away. And being in community with other believers just is not a priority. And then life happens. And then it's like, oh, I need some people to pray for me. Like, where you been? Well, don't worry about that, but uh, I need you to pray for me. <laughs> Why? Because I got this going on, I got that going on, I got this going on, I got that going on. That's like, cool. That's cool. You do know that sometimes preventative maintenance is good for you. So I'll go to my last point so you can go wherever you got to go today. Here's my last point. Our choice of friends, circle, or community is therefore one of the most important choices we will make. Who you allow to be in your close circle of friends, your five, that's the most important decision you can make because those people are going to influence all of your life. All of your life. So those five people, that circle of influence, that social network, we need to choose carefully who we place in that group. Why? They affecting us. So in Psalm 1, just want to read it, and then uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Psalms 1 says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Psalm says, 
Uh, you're blessed when you make the choice not to allow certain people in your group. You bless when you make the choice not to allow. It's like, hey, I love you like Jesus wants me to love you, but that don't mean you're going to be in my group. I will pray for you. I wish the best for you, but you can't be here. Not here. Mm-mm. Come on. See, we, we don't know how to make that distinction. Like, I can love you and you not be one of my closest friends. We we'll have to talk every day for me to love you, for me to desire the best for you, for me to pray for you, for me to encourage you. No, no, you don't have to be in my closest friend group. So here's another one, 1 Corinthians 5, just a little more direct. Um, Paul says, um, as he's dealing with sin in Corinth, sin that's running rampant amongst Christians, he said, no, 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 no. When I, when I warned y'all about not hanging out, associating with sinners, people who were living raggedy, I wasn't talking about people in the world. He said, if I was talking about people in the world, y'all wouldn't be able to hang out with nobody. He said, no, 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 no. I'm talking about people in the church. So he says this, verse 11. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worship idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. And then he has this little note. Don't even eat with such people. Hmm. Eating was, as we talked about, a sign of this person is a part of my community. I'm connected to them. I affirm who they are. They're, they're significant to me, and I align with them in my value system. He says, no, no, you get, you get to choose. And, and there are some people, even in the body, where you got to say, we can't hang out. Why we can't hang out? Well, because you are making some choices right now. And even though you've been confronted by the word of God, you say to God, I don't care what you got to say. I'm going to do what I want to do. And anybody who has the audacity to tell God, I don't care what you got to say. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't need to have close to me. I know it's hard. I'm not giving up on you. I'm going to keep praying for you. Man, I wish the best for you. But you're in a state of rebellion right now. And, and no, nah, we, can't, we can't go to lunch. That was hard for some of y'all to hear. So here's the basic premise. The people we hang out with, people who influence us, will impact. They're going to help or hinder us. So we got to make choices. So we look back at our list of our five closest friends, and we start with conversations to say, you know what, I've been, I've been assessing our relationship. <laughs> and there are some things I just think we need to talk about. Here are the goals that I have for my life. I want to be a loving husband. I want to be a father who is present and nurturing. I don't just want to provide, but I want to be present and nurturing, right? I want to be a son who is concerned about his parents, right? I want to be a sibling who shows love to his brothers or his sisters. I want to be a Christ follower who values obedience, right? And just say, man, those are, just some of, those are some of the things that's important to me. Tell me about the things that are important to you. And except if we don't align, let's talk through this. Let's see where we're going with this relationship. So I close with this. Uh, Darren Hardy in his book, The Compound Effect, says, according to research, the people you habitually associate with determine as much as 95% of your success or failure in life. So again, who are your five closest people in your life? What impact are they having on your life? 
Do you have significant friends who help you grow? Do you have friends who are hindering you? Do you need to make any changes to your social network to become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Start with prayer. Start with prayer. Here's all I wanted you to hear today. Your social network matters. Your social network matters. So let's bow together. Daddy, this is a challenging word for me to wrestle with. I imagine, likewise, a challenging word for people to hear. Um, I pray that if in any space I miscommunicated, that you would provide the opportunity for me to correct it. I pray where your word is clear that we would embrace your word. I pray more than anything that instead of us deciding what we may not like about the message, that we would see this as an opportunity for us to evaluate our relationships with people, to evaluate the friends we have, and whether or not they're helping us to be who you call us to be. Everybody that we associate with doesn't have to be in our close five. Everybody doesn't have to be our closest friend. We can have some acquaintances. Doesn't mean we love them any less. We just understand the impact of those who are closest to us. I pray that children would hear the message and think about their friend group. They, they would start early. I pray that teenagers would wrestle with where they stand, the people that they're hanging out with, the people they're listening to who are influencing them. I pray that each of us, no matter what stage in life we're in, would just hear your voice and say, Daddy, help me to sift through what you want me to do. So we surrender to you. You are our Father. And as our Father, you desire the best for us. You sent Jesus, and Jesus, you gave your life that we might not only have a relationship with the Father, but be able to live a life that's pleasing and honoring to the Father. And we want to do that. So help us, as much as lies within us, to surrender ourselves afresh to our Daddy who loves us with an everlasting love and be able to embrace your plan for our lives. We realize, Daddy, that Walking in the narrow way is not easy. That's why, Jesus, you call it a narrow way. But give us the grace to walk in the narrow way so that we can be pleasing and honoring to you. So speak in this place as we celebrate you. Our Father, who is holy, who has called us to be holy as he is holy. Bless us as we give you glory and as we bless your name. For some today who may need prayer to say, man, I want to be better. I want to honor God in what I do. Pray that you would bring them forth, that they might receive the prayer and encouragement. Some who may say, I need to take this step to allow God to be my father. And as I allow him to be my father, I can surrender to him, and he'll show me how to be holy. So hear our prayer now, Daddy. We invite our leaders to come. If you